you got to think of it this way. It's quite an experience to be second in Perry Bay by centimeter. Welcome to the Canadian Cycling Magazine podcast. I'm Matthew Piaro, editor of the magazine and host of the pod. Do you remember what race was supposed to run this Sunday? It was supposed to be Perry Roubaix. But more important, do you remember who won Perry Roubaix on April 8th, 1990? Well, when Belgian Eddie Plankert and Canadian Steve Bauer crossed the line on the Roubaix Velodrome 30 years ago, neither of them was sure. After a lot of deliberation by race officials, the win went to Plankert. After 265 and a half kilometers of hard racing, Plankert beat Bauer by millimeters. In March, I spoke with Bauer. The CCC Pro Team Sports Director had recently returned home to St. Catharines, Ontario from Europe and was in self-isolation. We discussed the monument that almost, almost went to a Canadian. Steve Bauer, while you were a professional racer, what did Perry Roubaix mean to you? Well, I think as a, as I turned professional and and you know moved into Europe, um, it was one of the you know it was one of the big deals, one of the one races that uh, I thought I would could do well at and uh, made it part of my goals, you know, to, to do my best. And so, yeah, it was, it, was, it became a focus. Um, I wouldn't say an obsession, but yeah, okay. That's uh, being professional is understanding the race in, in, in and out. And, you know, that's, that's what I did. I became a study of it uh, as I should. Tell me more about your preparation and reconnaissance, especially for the 1990 edition of Perry roubaix well, I don't think 90 was too much different than any other year. Usually you would pick a day or two uh, to review the course and, and ride it and, uh, you know, re-familiarize yourself with, the, you know, the, the Pave sectors and how you get into them is, is all important. And, you know, whether you're turning left into them, right into them, or straight on, or when, when, they, when they're coming up, those, you know, repetitions just make it all the better understanding of how the race evolves but yeah usually you would do a, a recon a solid uh, ride either the wednesday or the the thursday before the the race um i think often it was thursday you know thursday then you have friday saturday recuperations and sunday race were there any particular sectors that year that uh, concerned you more than others uh well you, you always had to be not you know not any particular one would stand out but um you know each one was could could be decisive so you you, know, you could had to be on your toes at all times i mean the the forest of Arenberg is always like a, a turning point um usually because it's it's a fairly large peloton that enters there and it's about 100 k's to go and you come out, and depending on the wind, you, you know the race is broken up, or you know it's 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 diminished, you know, and the race sort of starts from there. So it's a really important point whether or not it kind of goes from there or not. It's different, but um, you know that that's a turning point. And then as you you know knock off each sector along the way, you always have to be alert to you know certain conditions, whether it's wet or muddy or uh, the wind direction is always important. Were there any special modifications that you made to the Eddie Merckx bike that you took to that race? I think it was only year one that I put extra handlebar tape on. Other than that, I never, you know, adjusted the handlebars at all. Sometimes you would lower your saddle just a little bit, your seat height, just to give you a little bit more, um, uh, how do you say, just a little more room, you know, uh, to be comfortable on the cobble so you didn't, you weren't bouncing on the saddle as much. You could you'd be a little bit more fluid. So, you know, those are a few things. You could raise your stem just a bit, you know, to be a little more upright, a little more comfort. Uh, that's about it. 
you know oh the the tires yeah you need to needed bigger tires at the time i think we were using vittoria greens not a green tread and uh they were 28 mil a meter i think during the 1990 Perry Roubaix, Eddie Plankert of Team Panasonic got away in a move with about 100 kilometers to go. You would face him later in the Roubaix Velodrome, but at that point, you were still back in the bunch. Uh, what gave you the confidence to stay there, or had the race decided your position at that point? You know, I think most big races are often about... Uh, you know, being patient and not sort of, uh, you know, exposing yourself to the wind and, and, and following the, the evolution of the race, um, methodically, uh, rather than going out too early and attacking. I mean, Plankart had an amazing ride to be out front in the wind all that time and, and still to win the race. Um, to have the energy still at the end of, you know, follow my attacks in the final, et cetera. So, you know, he, he, he was in, you know, pretty amazing form to be able to do that. Um, so yeah. So as, as I think if I recall following the evolution of the race, as the, the, the Peloton gradually disintegrates and gets smaller and then the attacks start, start opening up as riders tried to bridge across to that lead group, which was still, still uh out in front um then then it became a matter of timing you know having having good legs and timing the right attack to make the make the final move with plankard away and he was with uh, various riders for a while um, mostly um, marshall gaillon and kurt van kiersbrook um edwig van hoydonk then went clear to join that group and panasonic seemed to be trying to manage the uh, the bunch for Plankert Laurent Fignon was seemed to be doing a lot of work. It just seemed messy behind. How were you managing that situation? You know, I I, I think I was less aggressive than I typically would be, and that that probably helped me a lot. You know, just to have that patience and let everybody get get tired. You know, uh, attacking and and Fignon was extremely strong. He was very very strong. Uh, but he was also, um, I think he's, he's generally marked by the Panasonic guy. So they, they used up some of their gas to, you know, keep him in check and maybe other riders did too. And if I remember, I think it wasn't too long after Fignon made a fairly, very vicious attack that, that sort of, you know, hurt everybody. And then I went after that shortly after the bridge across, if it, that my memory <laughs> is correct. So, you know, Fignon was actually um, important for my outcome, you know, for him to be strong and actually doing a lot of the work sometimes that I would have done in other races. But uh, he he was instrumental in, in keeping that breakaway close, you know, by his constant attacking and trying to get away and trying to bridge. When you did join the lead group, uh, it became a group of six, including you. Then, I think it was on Carrefour de Labra, you pushed a little hard and you shattered that group. It was about 20 kilometers to go. Only uh, Van Hoyedonk and Plankert were able to keep up with you. Was it a conscious decision to try and, and split that group and, and get rid of people? Yeah, I mean, when when I bridged across the front group, I, I was feeling quite good. And I, I was actually quite surprised how quickly I got to them. Uh, and then, you know, I think there was a interlude where we we rode a bit together and then uh the careful larb is, is typically a classic attack point because of its you know twisty turns and and uh rough and you know sort of uh, cratered cobbles on each side of the 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 track there so it's it's a, is a, the first part of careful larb and all the way through is is very difficult so i d- i did a full on attack to try to try to go for it I think Eddie was just sort of like pinned on my wheel, like trying to trying to hold on for a while, and unfortunately I couldn't get rid of him. And but and Van Hoydonk was the only guy that came back at that point. Um, and from that point on, Eddie he didn't do a lot of work. You know, he was he was uh, saving himself for a sprint. I tried a couple times to get rid of him, but but couldn't. And I think that that's why you know the two other riders would catch us in the velodrome, Wampers and uh, Gaillon. 
and make it five for the sprint. Before you got to the velodrome, how was it working with two Belgians? Were you worried about a, a Belgian uh, uh, combine to uh, to work against you? No, I wasn't. I wasn't too worried about uh, Edwig Van Hoydonk. I mean, he seemed tired. Like he seemed a bit tired. Like I think I tried a couple attacks and and he he struggled to come back to us. The only reason why he came back to us each time was that he wasn't working with me. Um, or he wasn't working that hard, you know. So um, Eddie was definitely saving himself for the sprint, and I was just trying to keep keep us away or, or try to get away from them too. But I, I wasn't able to to drop either of them. So as you mentioned in the finale, um, the three of you come into the velodrome, and then you're joined pretty quickly by um, Marcel Gaillon and. Jean-Marie Wampers, who won the year before. He won Perry roubaix the year before. What were your thoughts when suddenly three became five? You know, it was a bit of a surprise, but I wasn't too concerned. I, I If you watch the video, I immediately went up the banking. Um, you know, the track experience was handy. Uh, so, yeah, I went up I went up the banking so I could see everything and, and not necessarily take the lead. Um, so then those other two guys, when they came through, they went right to the front, which which didn't really pose any problem. I think Wampers, you know, tried to lead out Eddie. So I was, you know, really, I was mostly concerned about Plankard, you know, because he he was, you know, on paper, probably the fastest sprinter. Um, and I, you know, I saw that Edwig had kind of like tracked up the banking and he was looking like to go maybe early so i accelerated as he he uh tried to come over the top and um you know so i saw his move coming which which was which was fortunate and then i you know i took his wheel as he came to the final bend but the thing was he didn't really i don't think he really had much go i wish he had a little bit more you know because then then i for sure would have i think i would have won the race but he he stalled so i had to kind of restart when I, but I was fortunate to, to drop down underneath and take the short line. The rest is history. You know, Eddie, uh, won the sprint by, uh, I guess it was a centimeter, something like that. It was so close that, um, it didn't seem like anybody was ready to raise his hands after the line. Um, <laughs> I don't think so. No. no. And then, so when you did cross the line, what, what were you thinking? Well, you know, immediately I was thinking that that I mistimed. I think we, you know, Eddie and I, we both mistimed the bike throw, which is obvious, you know, if you look at the photos and the videos, because the track is so big that the the line um, is kind of more <laughs> central to the straightaway, or it seems that way. I was just, you know, thinking that the, you know, you're you're sprinting with all your power and all your energy and it's almost like a blackout you don't really see things coming that well um so we both sort of threw our bike after the line you know um just because the line came up so fast um so yeah you could say mistimed bike throw yeah for sure uh but that's kind of just the way it was we and maybe eddie was just sort of had his elbows bent a little bit more (laughs) i don't know but that was the difference. What was it like waiting around for that, uh, for the decision by the uh, the race judges? Where do you remember where you were? Were you in the infield? Um, were you and how were you feeling? Yeah, I think it was in the infield. Um, you know, I wasn't I wasn't very confident that I got it. You know, um, probably just because of that that that. Uh, that feeling, you know, that, uh, I didn't get the bike throw in, you know, and, and part of that's just, be, I think just because you're putting so much effort into getting to the line and the, the straightaway was sort of so, seems so short, you know? Yeah. It's bizarre. You know, having a, like that track experience maybe been against me in a way, um, because, you know, you have a feeling of, of where the line is on a, on a velodrome. It just has, it seems to be further down the straight than in the center of the banking. Anyway, it was just, it was strange. I didn't, I didn't get the bike throw in, and that's why I lost the race, really. Do you think it was the right call? 
Well, Noel Diancar, he was the director at the time. He said he he, he saw that he saw the the sprint um, photo. I've I've seen it. I've seen it also, uh, but not at that time. I think it, <clears throat> I think it's legit. Um, you know, it better be. But anyway, that's the way it is. Plankert has said that winning by such a close margin made the victory more beautiful than by winning alone minutes ahead of the the, the riders behind. For you, does coming second by millimeters, conversely, make it more of a heartbreak? Um, no, not necessarily. I don't. It is what it is. You know, I, I race for the best race. You know, it's it's one of those things. Uh, same with my world championship in 1989 in Fly I had a flat tire at the top of the climb, final lap. Uh, would go to the sprint for the for the title with Le Mans and, and Kelly and others. But yeah, it is what it is. You race. This is the best race I ever rode in my career. And Paris Bay, same thing. What can you do? Uh, you have to be pra- pragmatic about it. You know, it's it's one of those things. I would say you're almost more than pragmatic. You're a bit zen. You're just a bit. This is this is how it went. <laughs> yeah, no, it's sport. It's a one day thing. It's it's it's. Um, uh, Perry Bay's what six hours and thirty five minutes. Uh, I don't remember the exact time, but that's all it is in your life. It's a bit. Uh, it's not a big. It's a big picture. It's a great memory too. You know, you got to got to think of it this way. It's quite an experience to be second in Perry Bay by a centimeter. It's true. It's uh, people don't usually remember second place, but they do in this case. <laughs> it's the most memorable second place of the history of the sport. There you go. <laughs> Steve Bauer, thank you very much. And that's the episode. It's put together by me, Matthew Piero. It's produced by Adam Killick. He composed the music, too. I had help from web editors Terry McCall and Lily Hansen-Gillis. Thanks to Ontario Creates for its support. Please rate our show. Five stars, like a really good sector of pave. This Sunday, as you face the absence of spring classics in 2020, do rewatch A Sunday in Hell, Jorgen Leith's documentary on the 1976 Perry Roubaix. And then I recommend you pick up William Fotheringham's book about the making of the documentary called Sunday in Hell. Wouldn't that just be hellacious? Which I mean in the the good way, like like not bad. I mean, uh, enjoy both hells, and I'll talk to you later. Mm-hmm.